Hi, Charles Sosa Booksage here, and this is episode 16 of my Harry Potter first time reread series. Now, if this is your first time here, I am rereading the Harry Potter series uh, for the very first time. Uh, I've taken the seven books and I've broken them up into roughly 52, 53 sections. And every week, I, every Sunday, I read a section of chapters, record my thoughts on them, and that's generally my Monday videos on my booktube channel. I also have other booktube content on Wednesdays and Fridays. So hit that like and subscribe button if that's something you're interested in. And let's get into this week's episode. Uh, I am continuing my Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire reread. This is chapters four through eight today. So let's get started. Chapter four, Back to the Burrow. So it's the next morning and Harry is waiting for the Weasleys to arrive to come pick him up and bring him back to the burrow, their house, and eventually to the Quidditch World Cup. And Harry spends a very quiet, tense day. The Dursleys just are getting more and more wound up and wound up, tighter and tighter and tighter as the day goes on. As it gets closer to, I think, 5 o'clock is when the Weasleys are supposed to arrive. And this whole scene, again, is one of my favorites in this book, too. Mr. Weasley, Fred, George, and Ron decide to arrive by flu powder. Except the fireplace in the Dursley's house is boarded up. And there's an electric fireplace there. So they end up coming inside the fireplace, and you can hear them in there behind all the boards kind of all ouch ouch and what are we doing here and all this stuff and then they realize harry is able to explain to them through the wood through the boards that it's all boarded up and just that whole scene of hearing them come in one at a time and being confused and not knowing what to do and it's just really well written and really really funny but then of course arthur blasts his way out of the fireplace and the Dursleys just completely freak out here. <laughs> and, but it's a really good contrast, too, between the Dursleys and the Weasleys. Because they're getting ready to leave, and they get Harry's like big trunk and everything, and off George goes. And, and then, as before Fred's leaving, Fred drops his candy, and then he picks it all up, but doesn't get them all and then in he goes and then Ron goes and it's just um, Arthur and Harry left and this is one of my favorite moments here and one of the reasons what I love about Arthur Weasley is he puts his arm like hand on Harry's shoulder and doesn't let Harry leave yet and he's like he's, he's looking at the Dursleys it's like you know your nephew is going to be gone you're not going to see him till next summer and you're going to say goodbye and he's just perplexed that they're saying nothing and then angry um like his face finds it just insulting and he basically forces mr <laughs> vernon uncle vernon dursley to say you know basically i'll see good you know i'll see you next year and of course you realize the moment fred dropped the candy you know it was on purpose, and you know there's going to be something in there that he dropped on that floor, knowing Dudley wouldn't be able to help himself. And, of course, Dudley is, starts screaming, and his tongue just flops out, and they don't know what's going on, and Aunt Petunia's trying to pull it out of him, not realizing that it's his tongue. <laughs> and eventually Harry leaves with um, Arthur having to hold off um, getting into a fight with Vernon, really. Vernon's, like, chucking things at him. <laughs> but, and then Harry's, like, goes the whole flu thing. and You kind of hear and see people going by on their way to other places. And then he's finally back at the burrow. And they're all laughing hysterically about what happened with Dudley. And Arthur finally apparates and shows up, pops up out of the blue, and is kind of cross with Fred and George. And tells, wait till I tell your mother. Not really meaning to, but then, of course, that's right when she walks in. And the rest of the kids are like, oh, we're going upstairs. We're getting out of the, the hell out of the way here. And that's pretty much how the chapter ends. Um, just a quick, fun, hysterical scene. And I really, really enjoyed it. It's really, really well written. I don't remember 
how they come and pick Harry up in the movie. It's been a while since I've seen Goblet of Fire. And I really don't remember that like transition scene from being with the Dursleys and how he got to the Weasley's house. So I'm going to pay attention to that next time I watch the movie just to see. Because I don't remember them particularly being stuck behind a fireplace like in the book. So f feel free to drop it in the comments what happened in the movie because I just don't rec recollect at this point. It's funny, as I'm reading this book, this, this, this series again, um, more of the book is reasserting itself. More of the story in the book is reasserting itself and the changes in the movies are beginning to like, fade out and drop away. And uh, it's interesting. Just a little kind of thing I've noticed. But a quick little short little chapter. And now it's on to the next one. Chapter 5, Weasley's Wizarding Wheezes. <laughs> uh, and this again, this is another really wonderful chapter. I love all the scenes we get at the Weasley's household. There is always such a stark contrast to... Harry's time with the Dursleys, where everything's on eggshells at the Dursleys' house. And at the Weasleys' house, it's a big, loud, boisterous family. There's really never a dull moment. There's always something happening. And there's lots of joking back and forth, but underneath all of the shenanigans and jokes and everything is a family that really does deeply love each other. And it's nice for Harry to get these moments even if they're temporary and not where he lives, it's still good for him to be able to experience this, even if it's in these small doses. Now, what's interesting here, we get to meet Bill and Charlie. All the Weasleys are there. They're all, they've all come home for the Quidditch World Cup. Um, Percy is now working at the ministry in, I believe it is the Department of International Magical Cooperation which, of course, he just keeps going on and on about how he's working there and Mr. Crouch this and Mr. Crouch that. And we get a reminder of, I believe, was it Bertha Jorkins? Her disappearance is brought back up in this chapter. And we also have um, the character of Bagman is mentioned in, in conjunction with um, Bertha's disappearance. She worked in Bagman's department. And I know we're going to get to Bagman in a couple of chapters from now, in Bagman and Crouch later on. So it's even in the midst of the work, the Weasleys and the fun family element, um, we're still getting from Rowling. She's starting to layer in the story and layer in important things to start paying attention to. And it makes me wonder this whole scene with the Weasleys, like what would have Harry's life had been like had James and Lily not been murdered, had that whole confrontation with Voldemort not gone down the way it went? What kind of home life would Harry have had with his family? Would Sirius be visiting all the time and Remus? Would it be a more lively household? Um, probably not as cacophonous as the Weasley's house, but probably a, a lot more life and love and and care and everything that he gets at the Dursleys where it's everything so strict and proper and controlled. And just overall a nice scene. And at the end of the chapter, while well, Rowling brings us back around to remind us that Harry had his scar hurting and that dream and he still hesitates to tell his friends because he's enjoying the moment and they're enjoying the moment and he doesn't want to like damp put a damper on anything but it's just we've had a nice transitional scene here and Quidditch World Cup is coming up soon and Rowling is making sure hey don't forget this don't forget this pay attention to this so again really nicely woven into the story here so again nice quick little chapter gives us that nice Weasley home life slice which is always really uh, fun to see. Chapter 6, The Port Key. Now this is a really quick chapter. It's only about 10 pages long. It's really early in the morning. They're all woken up. It's before dawn and they've got to make their way to the Quidditch World Cup. And interestingly enough, Percy, 
Bill and Charlie are old enough, they can apparate straight to the World Quidditch Cup. They don't have to um, journey, however, Harry and everyone is going to journey, and Harry learns they're going to travel by port key, the rest of them. So Mrs. Weasley's staying behind with her three oldest sons, and she's going to apparate with them later. And Mr. Weasley takes Fred and George and Ron and Hermione and Harry with him. Um, they're going to go march off to wherever this port key is. But before they can get out of the house, Mrs. Weasley realizes Fred and George have stuffed the ton tongue toffee thing they made, which Dudley had eaten in the earlier chapter. They've got it stuffed in their pockets and all over the place, hidden. They intend to take it to the Quidditch World Cup and sell it. And Mrs. Weasley, of course, confiscates all of it from them, much to their chagrin. And they're not happy about it because this is, again, what they want to do for a living. But off they go, and it's a march through town, and then up this big, big hill. And somewhere on top of this hill is the port key. And when they get there, and they're looking around for the port key, they stumble across Amos Diggory and his son Cedric, who we met in the last book. Cedric is the seeker of Hufflepuff. And that's the one match that the Gryffindor house lost last year. Only because uh, all that stuff went down with Harry falling off the broom and everything. And But it's a great, nice reintroduction to Cedric, who's going to become a key player in this book. And, of course, it's a reminder of Harry Potter, you know, Amos is, this is his first time meeting Harry Potter, and it's like we saw, I think, more in the first book in particular, that kind of like shock and surprise when they, you know, when Harry, these people meet him, and Harry's used to it, but still kind of embarrassed by it, and then it's, the port key happens to be this boot, and then they're all standing there holding onto this boot <laughs> in a circle, and they get whisked away. And boom, they arrive at their destination. All of them fall flat on their face, except for Arthur, Amos, and Cedric. And that's the chapter really, really quick. It's um, a nice introduction to traveling by port key, which, again, plays a role, I think, multiple times in this series after this. And we learn about splinched, I think it's called. Um, if you try to travel and you mess it up, like apparate, and you mess it up, you can like split your body and leave half of your body behind and then you get stuck. And then one of these magical departments has to come and put you back together. <laughs> uh, again, useful information and all that stuff that will just come into play overall in the whole story later. I don't remember if, it, if anyone gets splinched in this book. I'm curious to see if it was brought up here specifically for something in this book or just general world building for later on. Uh, again, it's this is my first time rereading this book since I read it originally many years ago. Um, the first four books I read over that Thanksgiving weekend, back to back to back to back in about three days. So it's been a while since <laughs> I've read this, but really, really enjoying it. Again, this is now six chapters in, and we haven't even gotten to the Quidditch game yet. But it's a nice, well-paced lead-in to the main story. Chapter 7, Bagman and Crouch. This is a great um, introduction scene, transition scene, um, leading up to the actual Quidditch match that's going to take place in the next chapter. Uh, we get to the other destination of the port key. They arrive. Uh, they're near some big field uh, in the moors somewhere. That's actually owned by a muggle, and they encounter the muggle who lets them know where they're supposed to be going on his property. And apparently, uh, the muggle is getting really suspicious because of all these strange people showing up. And in the middle of a conversation with Mr. Weasley, uh, a wizard apparates, obliviates, um, wipes the guy's memory, which apparently he, he keeps up to doing to him about five times a day because <laughs> it's just it's impossible to hide that something obviously not normal is happening. But anyway, they get their maps, off they go. Um, they're going through the whole, like, sort of camp. They're down on the other side by the woods, which is nearer to where the actual game's going to be played. And then they arrive at their sort of little 
reserved spot. And I get a kick out of this scene because it's always fun watching Mr. Weasley. I'll try to be act like a muggle. And he could easily put the two tents that he's borrowed from a friend up with his wand and get them up in moments. But he wants to do it the muggle way. And, of course, he just assumes Harry being a mug, Harry having... And, of course, he just assumes since Harry grew up as a muggle, pretty much, not knowing he was a wizard, then Harry's supposed to know every muggle thing, which, of course, Harry's never been camping in his life because the Dursleys never took him to do much of anything. But it pretty much takes Harry and Hermione to figure out how to actually put the tent up. And up they get it up. And this is, I remember when I first read this moment, I was like, ah, very TARDIS-like. Because he goes inside one of these tiny little tents, and inside it's like a three-bedroom apartment kind of, like, big sprawled-out space. And I remember thinking, ah, bigger on the inside, like the TARDIS, when they first read it. And I wonder, like, what that scene is like for... Um, kids reading this who maybe never don't even know what Doctor Who is and don't know that, you know, the bigger on the inside kind of thing. I'm just, it's something I remember it striking me when I first read it the first time. Um, but Harry, Hermione, and Ron are sent off to get water. And this is a great um, part of this chapter because we get to look at the camp as a whole. Um, there's this, the Irish section, because it's Ireland and Bulgaria are the teams playing in the, in the Quidditch World Cup. And the Irish have all their tents like covered in shamrocks, and it looks like, like hills instead of actual tents, and they're pretty much just partying at this point. Seamus is there. Uh, his friend Dean is hanging out with him there. We get to meet Seamus' mother. And... We also hear mention of what the Bulgarians have. So they go and then check out the Bulgarian section, and there is this a poster of Victor Crumb everywhere, outside of every single tent, and it's Crumb just kind of blinking and scowling because <laughs> that's kind of Crumb's thing. Of course, Harry has no idea who Victor Crumb is, and Ron lets him know that he's, you know, he's like the best seeker in the world and all this stuff. And they're going to be rooting for Ireland, but, you know, Ron is, you know, Victor Crumb is Ron's favorite player. And uh, we also see a lot of other, like, strange wizards and all sorts of things happening. Uh, we see uh, Cho Chang is mentioned. She's there, kind of. Harry, like, spills water on himself, waving to her and everything. So a, a really good scene because we're reintroduced to a lot of Hogwarts people, even if it's just passers-by. And we get a look at just the wizarding world in general and how really horribly they are at trying to pretend to be muggles. And I remember they're, they're stuck in line uh, waiting for the water behind this one wizard who's basically wearing a, a woman's nightgown and he won't put on trousers. <laughs> Is much, no matter how much the Ministry of Magic guy is trying to convince him, though, only muggle women wear that. you got to put trousers on. And But he likes the breeze. And we also get the revelation that Hogwarts is not the only wizarding school. That obviously, Harry kind of, oh yeah, it's obvious now looking around at all these people from all these different countries, speaking all these different languages, there'd be other wizarding schools. Because Hogwarts, Hogwarts is up in Scotland, in the Highlands by the looks of it. And he makes sense, so... Hermione, of course, obviously, though, knows this because Hermione reads everything. But uh, it's a good little introduction to the reader as well, uh, which is a nice setup for this particular book because of the whole Goblet of Fire and that whole wizarding uh, challenge that's coming. It's, uh, it, this is a nice way to just begin to let the reader know, yes, there are other schools. But they make their way back, and then we get to meet uh, was it Ludo Bagman, who's kind of in charge of the whole pulling off the World Cup. And we also meet Barty Crouch, because they both come over. And uh, first, Bagman comes over, and he's talking to um, Mr. Weasley and them. And they, Mr. Weasley is convinced to bet, and he bets like a galleon. And then Fred and George is like, okay, they're going to bet every penny they've ever saved, which is like 37 galleons and all sorts of other stuff, that Ireland's going to win, but Crumb is going to get the seeker. 
And <laughs> Ludo takes that bet, of course, thinking there, there's no way that's going to happen. And, uh, and then Barty Crouch shows up. We get an anticipation and a setup here because something is going to happen at Hogwarts this year. Something big and they're all excited about but can't tell anybody because the ministry hasn't announced it yet. And uh, so we just get that little teaser here in this chapter. But then off they go and night falls and they're finally ready to go to the actual World Cup. And that's pretty much where the chapter ends. Just an overall great camp scene where we get to see so many little tastes and pieces of all sorts of different wizards and just office talk and things back and forth. The conversation about uh, a wizard in the Middle East who wants to like get the ban on flying carpets overturned so he can import <laughs> or export rugs here to England and sell them to everybody to try to, rather than broomsticks. Uh, just it's nice little touches and world building touches here in this chapter. But overall, a really great setup chapter for chapter eight, which is up next. Chapter eight, the Quidditch World Cup. So it's finally game time. Uh, Mr. Weasley and his family have the tickets that they got from Bagman are actually in the top box. So they have the best seats in the house. They're up there with, um, they arrive first, get the front row seats in the box, and then other people start arriving. Cornelius Fudge, the Minister of Magic, arrives with the Bulgarian Minister of Magic. Um, but first, there's a, a house elf sitting there holding a seat. And at first, Harry thinks it's Dobby. And it turns out it's a different house elf called Winky, which we learn then is Barty Crouch's house elf. And she's holding the seat for Barty Crouch for when he arrives later. And we hear, get a little update on Dobby, how Dobby's doing. And according to Winky, Dobby's all full of himself, believing he should be paid for work. And we just get a little more background on the house elves. And this is Ron and Hermione's first time actually seeing the house elf because they never actually met Dobby um, when Dobby was around in uh, the Chamber of Secrets book. So they, this is a, a new experience for them. But... Um, other people start arriving. The box starts filling up. We have a tense moment where the Malfoys show up. We get to meet um, Draco's mother for the first time here. And then it's on to the match itself. And interestingly, I'd forgotten all about the, the t team mascots um, portion of it. And you have the this what's they're called the Vila come out. And there are these beautiful women who don't aren't really human, obviously. Uh, and they dance and do all this stuff, and they have this power to mesmerize, almost like a siren. And Harry just starts getting this crazy idea that he should leap off the top box down to the ground to try to impress them. <laughs> and Hermione obviously is not um, enamored by their powers because it pretty much works on men, I guess. But it's a, an interesting, fun moment. And then the leprechauns for the Team Ireland do their thing and drop shamrock gold and all this stuff all over the place. So it's a fun kind of back and forth. Uh, and then the match itself starts. And this is an interesting Quidditch match because we've had a Quidditch match in the first three books. And those, of course, which is at Hogwarts. And they were fun because they were told mostly through the play-by-play -play commentary of one of the students. And it made for an entertaining scenes. This is the first time we get a little play-by-play -play from Bagman. Um, but most of the action is actually written out by Rowling in this time. So it's, it's a bit of a different feel. And we get Quidditch played on an elite level, way beyond anything that um, the students at Hogwarts can do. And Harry gets a look at what it's really like to play this game at the top level. And the binocular things that they have, the omnoculars or whatever they are, are really cool. You can slow things down, do replays, and get play-by-play. -play, and it'll even tell you what kind of maneuvers the teams are using. And uh, So that, that's, that added a lot to the scene as well, to have those sort of magical elements. Because um, it makes sense uh, you would have that. Which is, interestingly enough, as augmented reality and all those things and... Uh, mixed reality uh, technology develops, we'll eventually have similar things in real life where you'll be able to see those all those kinds of extra things 
um, like enhancing your experience of watching a game or watching a match. And it's a really fun scene, back and forth and brutal, and the two seekers, Crum and Lynch, going head to head, and Crum obviously being the better. Ireland had the better team, and Crum, of course, had the much better, was a much better seeker. And it ends just as Fred and George had bet <laughs> that Crum would get the seeker, but Ireland would win. And the chapter ends with Fred and George going right up to Bagman. It's like, all right, give us our winnings. <laughs> but overall, a fun, fun chapter. You know, we've had, the book has been building up to this scene, or at least the reader believes that this is what this whole beginning has been building up towards. It's actually been building up to the next chapter, which will be next week. Um, but um, this is just a fun, fun moment um, before the, the story really starts and the, the darker parts of the Wizarding World that we get really from here on out for the rest of the series begin to emerge. We got hints of them in Prisoner of Azkaban, but now we start to see them, and we're about to get hit with them really soon here, I think in the next chapter. But like I said, that's next video. And overall, uh, five fun chapters. Uh, always entertaining, getting to spend all this time with the Weasleys and outside of Hogwarts before we even get there. And uh, just a really, really fun set of chapters. Lots of things in here. Uh, lots of great world building and setup. And I'm really looking forward now to the next set as we start to move into the main story. And I want to know from you, what did you think of the Quidditch World Cup itself and just the whole experience of this first eight chapters of this book uh, as we're moving towards getting closer to the events that are now going to take over the story? i um, curious, what did you think of this particular um, Quidditch match? Because it is written very differently than the previous ones with just the Hogwarts students playing. So next week, our chapter is 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, the Dark Mark, Mayhem at the Ministry, Aboard the Hogwarts Express, and the Triwizard Tournament. So really good stuff coming up. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. And... This is a wrap for this week, and I will see you in the comments, and I will see you in your comments. I am Charles of the Book Sage. Happy reading. <laughs>